Today, we are back in the book of Luke, and we're going to look at two instances where Jesus interacts with people. And um, if you think you have a busy day, you've got to enter into the life of Jesus. If you remember uh, where we were last week, we saw that he went on a three-hour tour <laughs> over the Sea of Galilee where this literally demonic storm came up, and they thought they were going under. But Jesus said, we're going over. And so they ended up on the other side. If you remember the demoniacs that he found there who were in the caves, and they were demon-possessed, and they didn't want anything to do with people. They were driven away from people, and people wanted them that way. And um, Jesus goes right up to them, and he casts the demon out of this one guy and into the pigs, and they go over the, over the cliff. And the people of that area say, you gotta, you got to get out of here, Jesus. We don't want you here. And that's the way it is when they see the power of God sometimes, and especially if it affects them financially. People don't want to submit their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we get started, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus who came for us to teach us and to die for us. I pray that you help us, Lord, as we look at your word, that you might write a new chapter in our hearts and help us to understand you better and that it would affect the way that we live. I thank you for this time, Lord. Be with every heart. You know our needs. You know our struggles. And you love us anyway. So, Lord, I thank you. Be with us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in chapter 8 of Luke. You're going to see Jesus moving through the crowds, and somebody reaches out and grabs his clothes. I don't know if you've ever had that happen other than someone who's two years old and under. But somebody's reaching out for Jesus. And we're also going to see Jairus, a man, a man named Jairus who has a daughter who is ill, and he goes to get Jesus to have him bring her back to make her well. So as we look at these two things, I just want to uh, remind you where you are and what we went over last week. Jesus went on the three-hour tour over the, the Sea of Galilee. There was a storm that whipped up, and of course, Jesus fell asleep. It was the only time he got to sleep was in commuting. And so he crashed, and the disciples wake him up just before going under, apparently, and say, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus wakes up, and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and he says, be muzzled, which is interesting. It's what he speaks to the demons when they possess people, which tells me the storm was demonic. And instantly everything became calm. And Jesus looks at them and says, so where's your faith? Jesus can make me feel like a piece of dirt too sometimes. Where's your faith? Waking Jesus up at the very last moment. Isn't that what we do though? We get in trouble and we reach out for him. We pray and we get on our knees and you know, 9-11 happens and everybody's calling on the Lord and then everything goes away and everyone forgets. So the whole reason Jesus went over was to see this one guy specifically and cast a demon out of him into these pigs over the hill. And then Jesus getting back in the boat tells the man to go home to his family. So apparently he has a family, except he's been separated for years because of his issues. But he wants to go with Jesus. He wants to travel with Jesus. But Jesus figures the best thing for you to do is to go home and be a testimony to them. And isn't that always the case for us? That's always the place where we get to live out practically our ministry is at home. And so that was uh, last week. This week, we're looking at sickness and death and Jesus' power over it. In verse 46, you'll see on your, on your brochure this morning, and Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Somebody touched me. That's usually what I hear in, in the back seat when my kids were young. <laughs> Stop touching me. You're touching me. He touched me first. Yeah. Just a flashback. I've been triggered. Sorry. Beginning in verse 40. And so it was when Jesus returned 
that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Can you imagine being stalked at this level? Jesus gets in the boat for a little three-hour tour, goes across, quiets the storm, goes over, casts the demons out, gets the guy some clothes, gets him on his way, sends him home. The people say, we don't want you here. Jesus leaves. He gets back in the boat. He comes back, and everybody's waiting for him. Stalkers everywhere, like the paparazzi. So he comes back after this excursion, and there's all of these people waiting for Jesus to come back. Nothing like being thrust into your work day right away, right? There's no, no weariness that Jesus is allowed to have. He's been busy all of this time, and he comes back, and all of the people throng him, which means they're all, you know, up in his face and all up against him. Uh, it reminds me of a story of a, a woman in uh, Australia who was waiting for a bus, uh, waiting for a train, and there was a train coming, and everybody thought that was the train that was going to stop, and it didn't. It just kept going. But they all were pushing on this woman who had her baby in a carriage, and kept pushing her and pushing her, and finally the baby went over and ended up on the rails. And she's standing there, and she's seeing this train barreling down, and the train doesn't stop quickly. And she says, oh my God, and she cries out to God, and she passes out. Luckily, somebody grabs her. She doesn't end up on the tracks. The train hits the baby in the carriage and stops almost a half, an, uh, half a mile later. And remarkably... The engineer gets down and they look and the baby's been preserved inside. Just uh, had a, a fractured skull and a broken arm, but it just remembers, it just reminds me, you, we tend to get that way, don't we? You know, we get anxious about something and, you know, we can all kind of start crowding and then pretty soon we're right on the edge. And it's the way it was for Jesus. And if you have any claustrophobia whatsoever, you're not up to that. You know, that's just not something you want. But Jesus being thrust before these people immediately. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was the ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. In the midst of Jesus coming back from all of this and the th people thronging him and, you know, all getting in his face, there's one man that breaks through the crowd. His name is Jairus. And he knows he's got to see Jesus because his only daughter, who's 12 years old, is home dying. It's interesting because he knows who to go to, doesn't he? Not like the disciples who waited to the very last minute before they were going down. Jairus knows, hey, my daughter's dying and Jesus just arrived on the shore. You know he pushed his way through to get in front of Jesus through this crowd. I wonder how he knew. And then I did some research. And if you remember when we were back in Luke 4, Jesus was at his synagogue and healed a man. In chapter 4 of Luke... And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbaths. That's where this guy was. And they were astounded at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, that you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Yeah, what, a, what a great church service that must have been. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And then the demon had thrown him in their midst and it came out of him and it didn't hurt him. And they were all amazed and they spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went throughout every place in the surrounding region so now we know how Jairus knows who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. He saw it at his own synagogue. And so he makes a beeline for Jesus as soon as he hits the sand. He didn't wait for the last minute like the disciples in the boat. But Jesus, as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Can you imagine 
being this man, his only daughter of 12 years old, he's running to get Jesus to help in some way, and he's hindered by the crowd. And then once he gets Jesus' attention and tells him the mission, Jesus is like, I'm on it. Let's go. And you're not going anywhere real fast. You know what it's like when you have to be somewhere and you're afraid you're going to be late? I know none of you struggle like I do. Which is why I wake up at 5 a.m. and I, I make sure I'm there early because I hate sweating being late. And, you know, I know what speed limit is, but my golly, I'm going to be late. It's rough. And imagine Jairus trying to get Jesus through this crowd while everyone's trying to, to come to Jesus. Jesus sets his attention on one man and one mission. And yet all of these people seem to be in the way. That's a heck of a way to look at people though, isn't it? Running between you and whatever mission it is you have. And I can see Jairus saying, you know, out of the way, out of the way. You know, we got, you know, things to do, places to go, people to see. And everyone not listening. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. In the middle of all this pushing and shoving, there's a woman there, and she has an ailment. She's been bleeding for 12 years. I don't know if any of you are familiar with blood loss, but it tends to sap you of energy. You don't have iron, and your iron is, is getting lost. And um, it's just a very, I'm sure it's a very draining experience. I've seen it. I haven't experienced it myself. But she's bleeding for 12 years. Now, the scriptures are very clear about such a person. This woman would be considered unclean. She's not to be touched. Everything she sits upon would be unclean. Every place where she would lay would be unclean. Anybody who touched her would be considered unclean. All of this in the name of hygiene, of course, uh, where they didn't have things like refrigerators and they didn't have sinks everywhere and toilets and, and, and feminine hygiene products and all of that. So here's what it says in Leviticus. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days other than the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity, which is she's completely unclean, untouchable. She shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies and all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and whatever she sits on shall be unclean, and the uncleanness of her impurity. Whoever touches those things shall be unclean. He shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So there's this whole ritual around a menstrual cycle, and for seven days you're to be separated, and you're not supposed to touch anybody or have anything to do. Imagine 12 years not being able to touch people, not being able to worship not being able to gather. I mean, COVID will teach you a little bit of that. But here's a person who, when she goes out in public, is, is breaking the law, <laughs> the law of God. And she has to go secretly so nobody sees her because they all know that she's got this issue. It's a small town in Capernaum. And so she's basically shunned by everyone. And she just, she says, I, I got to go and I got to go to Jesus. Jesus can heal me. I know he can. And it says that she went to the doctors and she spent all of her money on these doctors to get better and none of them could do anything. Can you imagine the hopelessness of being 12 years in this condition, seeking medical help and not getting any? I mean, she probably sought, you know, medical doctors. She probably sought religious people for wisdom and understanding. My goodness, people even go to witch doctors, you know, to, to try to solve a problem like that, you know, uh, in addition to the, the homeopathic and, the, you know, you, you go to all sorts of ways to try to resolve these issues, but she found no hope. And so she comes up from behind him. You always have to be careful when you walk up behind somebody. 
uh, especially if it's at night and I'm unlocking my car. It's not a good idea. But this woman is now breaking through the crowd, hiding and breaking through the crowd to just, just so she could touch Jesus and came from behind and touched the border of his garment. Interesting. I, I think she's probably the first one that did this. But if you look in Mark 6:56, this is what's said. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, and the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Don't you find that unusual? That just sounds like so much superstition, right? How many of you have a rabbit's foot? You got a rabbit's foot? You, you get something hanging around you for good luck? It's almost like that, or at least it seems that way. Unless you understand the Old Testament scriptures and you understand how the Jews dressed in that day. It says here in Numbers chapter 15, verses 38 to 40, speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, that you may not follow the harlotry of which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember to do all my commandments and to be holy for your God. So you see, the hem of the garment, which had these tassels on it, these were designed as a memento that as you looked at these, you would remember the law of God, the Ten Commandments, who God's called you to be, what you're supposed to do, and your identity. So it was very much tied to who you are. And it was one of those things that had this blue thread. The blue was said to be the color of heaven or the sky. And so as, as you look to these tassels, um, you think about who you are in Christ. You think about who you are in God. And that's important so that you wouldn't do the things you would otherwise do. It's a little bit, you know, we wear crosses to indicate that we believe in Jesus and, um, you know, whether you, have a, whether you have a Jesus on the cross or a Jesus off the cross, I know where he is. You know where he is. But I remember the price that was paid for me so that I could be free. And so that's what it is. And this woman gets it in her mind. If I just reach out and if I could just touch the hem of his garment, this thing that he probably would use, I don't know if you've ever seen the Ascetic Jews or the Orthodox, they cover their head when they pray. And, you know, there's a lot of rocking that goes on. Well, that's the, that's the shawl that would have these tassels on it. It's, uh, it's a very interesting thing the more you get into it. But maybe she knew something more. It says here in Malachi 2, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, but you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, by the way, that's another word for the Messiah who would come, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. This, this word wings actually means borders. So it's not just like the, the feathers of, of a, a wing because obviously nobody has wings if you're a human being, right? But it's a way of speaking. And it also means the borders, like the borders of your clothes, where these tassels would be. It's rather interesting. I wonder if she knew the scripture enough to say, the son of righteousness, the Messiah who would come, there's healing in his tassels, or there's healing in the border of his clothing. And so this prophecy given about the Messiah, by her reaching out and grabbing hold of this, She's not trusting in the tassel to do anything. She's trusting in the one who wears the tassel. And it's a bit of a confession that he's the Messiah. But she said, all I have to do is reach out and just grab the hem of his garment. It's a sign of relationship, this border. It's a sign of responsibility before God. And it's also a reminder of our redemption because ultimately we will go to heaven and we'll stand before God and he will see us in grace, thankfully. Amen? Amen? And if you look through the scriptures understanding this, you'll see David and Saul, when, when Saul went into a cave, it says to relieve himself. And uh, David went up there and he cut a piece of the hem of his garment off. You go, wow, that's a much bigger deal now 
than what I thought it was. I thought he just clipped the tag off his T-shirt or something, but he cut probably one of the tassels off, which is a significant part of obeying the law. It's a significant part of who he is and his character and his authority. You think about Saul and Samuel, when Saul had sinned and he presumably took the position of high priest and began making sacrifices, and, and Samuel shows up, Samuel shows up and says, what are you doing? He says, well, you didn't come, you were late. So I, I got started without you, but he did things that he wasn't supposed to do. And Samuel says, that's it, you're done, you're over. You're not gonna be king anymore. God's gonna take you out. And then as Samuel went to walk away, he grabs for his clothes and he tears probably a tassel off of his clothing. And he says, just like this has been torn from my clothes, so the kingdom's gonna be torn from you. So as you read through the scriptures, they have a little bit more meaning. And Elijah, you remember when Elijah was gonna go, he was done, he was retiring. It says that he laid his mantle, or he, he laid his outer garment on Elisha and gave it to him. And it was a symbol of his authority and it had those tassels on it, on the border of that clothing. So it's a rather interesting thing. As you, as you learn new little chunks in the scripture, you can follow it through and go, <gasps> and you get kind of this epiphany. So at least for me, you people probably already knew. <laughs> Verse 44 says, and immediately the flow of her blood stopped. So the thing that she understood and the thing that she believed actually happened. She was able to reach through and grab his clothing, probably squeeze that, that tassel, and suddenly she knew she was healed. It, it worked. And now she's amazed, right? Can you imagine? After 12 years of being this way, she sneaks in secretly from behind and she grabs a hold of Jesus' clothes and she, she gets this healing. There's this sudden stop of blood and she knows it. She knows she's been healed. She's not gonna be an outcast anymore. She's able to have fellowship. She's able to be with her husband, with her children. She's able to sit where she wants and you know she's not considered unclean everything that she touches. She's no more the unclean person. Jesus does this today for us. He's the one who stops the bleeding in our life, isn't he? He's the one who makes us a new creature. He's the one that declares us unclean because he heals us on the inside. Amen. Jesus does it today. But I mean, how does this work exactly? Do you steal a healing? Can you pinch Jesus for a, for a miracle? You pick his pocket? I mean, it's, it, it's like that's what she did, right? She didn't come before his face and ask anything. She snuck it. You guys, you guys don't find that unusual. I find that unusual. I ask questions all the time. It's like stealing medical benefits, don't you think? <laughs> there was a compromise in God's law for this self-serving benefit. She had to compromise on God's law, break the law, and sneak through the crowd, even though she was unclean. Amen. So she could grab a hold of Jesus' tassel and be healed. I mean, what do you think about that? Does that mean, Pastor, I could break laws to get? No, it doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean that. <clears throat> I'm just trying to stir you up to think a little. Doesn't Jesus know? Can't he control his power? It just like slipped out through the tassel? <laughs> really? You people buy this? No. Do you think Jesus knew what was going on? Well, of course, he knows exactly what's going on. Immediately her blood stopped. I think about what Jesus said here in John chapter six, verse 36 to 40. Jesus says this, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you don't believe. He's speaking to the Pharisees at this point. All that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Do you notice there are two parts of that sentence? All that the Father gives me will come to me, comma, and in addition to that, the one who comes to me, I will no, my, no wise cast out. You see how welcoming Jesus is for even somebody to sneak up behind him and steal a miracle? Amen. That's the heart of our God. He's not like, what do you want? Uh, sometimes I think he's like my, my physical father, you know? I hate to bother you. 
You're darn right you're bothering me. I got things to do. No. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will no, my, no means cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Can I get an amen? amen. That is a promise from Jesus Christ himself, from God the Father concerning you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your boss, if he's the one that tells you what to do and you do it. If you've laid your life down before him at some point and said, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, you got to fix me, just like this woman bleeding for 12 years. And that's how we become new creations in Christ Jesus. Back to our story. And Jesus said, who touched me? Probably not like that, but. <laughs> who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. You ever feel power go out from you? Not like that. Somebody touched me. And everyone denied it. <laughs> Everyone's touching everyone here. You think somebody touched you? I mean, it's not like inappropriate. It's just everybody's touching everybody here. Jesus, you've got to be kidding me. And then he has to clarify for Peter. No, no, no. This was different. Somebody touched me in a way that was different than everyone else closing in on me. But everyone denies it because this woman is now going to be found out who she is. And she doesn't want everybody to know that this happened. She wants to keep it a secret. Out of all the people seeking Jesus in the crowd, Jesus was only seeking one. Out of everyone seeking him, he was only seeking one of them. And it was the one that pressed in with faith. And he was looking for her. And it didn't matter how many people were around him. He was seeking her. I find that unusual. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 13. You probably know part of this. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There's a desperateness that this woman has that Jesus appreciates. There's a desperateness that God our Father looks for. And sometimes it takes dramatic things in our life to bring us to this point. And sometimes the whole point of the difficulty you're going through is to get you on your knees to get you to realize you can't do it on your own, to get you back in or into a relationship with him. And it's amazing to me that God would go through all that trouble just to reach out to us so that you might have a relationship. It's not about making us do everything he says. It's, that's a worldly way of looking at it. He wants relationship. And he'll let a storm come to your boat so that you eventually get up and wake him up. Hopefully you do it nicer than Peter did. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, and she declared to him in the presence of the people the reason that she had touched him and that she was healed immediately. Do you think Jesus was going for a confession or a testimony? Somebody touched me and suddenly I see the crowd widening and she's still on the ground, which is probably how she was able to sneak up behind him. And there she is. I've been busted. Stealing a miracle. 
confession. This is what I did. This is what happened. It's a testimony. It's a testimony to the power of Jesus Amen. and what can happen if we are willing to reach out to him. And so it's for our benefit. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, does that sound like somebody who's angry because you picked a miracle out of their pocket? I want you to notice the first thing he does. He responds in love. Daughter. Daughter. He calls her daughter. That's a term of affection, isn't it? I mean, unless you don't use it that way all the time. Listen to me, daughter. You know, not good daughter. Be of good cheer. He says, basically, be happy. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. You didn't do anything wrong. And he allays her fears, which I'm sure she was all tied up with. And then he says, your faith has made you well. And I feel like if it was in Jersey version, it would be, you did it. You won. <laughs> you did it. And then he says, peace be with you. Go in peace. Jesus is like, we're good. Have a great life. Isn't that awesome? Yes. See, when I put it in my language, I like it. <laughs> we're good. Go and have a good life. Peace be with you. You're, you're right with God. And then he rewards her for her persistence and her pursuing of him. In faith, she rewards, he rewards her for that. Can you imagine walking away from that? I hope you can. I hope you're just like her. I hope Jesus reached out to you one day when you were broken and bleeding and twisted and there was nothing in this world that would satisfy you. And he came along Amen. and won your heart. Yep. And he says to you, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And so meanwhile, while he was still speaking, someone came to the ruler of the synagogue from the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher. In the midst of Jesus trying to get to a, a sick and dying girl in time, he's interrupted by a woman who reaches out and grabs his clothes and gets a healing, and now there's a whole scene. While Jesus is still speaking to this woman saying, daughter, somebody comes from the house and says, your daughter's dead. As the heart of a father, I can tell you he's probably extremely brokenhearted and wondering why the crowd prohibited him from getting Jesus out of there and why this woman reached out and grabbed his clothes and caused this commotion because they, they maybe have been able to be there by now. And, you know, all of the reasoning and the rationale that goes behind all that. And he's brokenhearted. I see something else in the passage. Jesus calls this woman daughter. And he gains a daughter, and I see this man loses a daughter. Oh, wow. Same term. And then I see this guy here in the middle. He needs some serious sensitivity training. <laughs> he needs some serious sensitivity training. Yeah. You don't walk up to a man and say, hey, your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the teacher. That's why I picked that picture. He got that face like you want to fix him. Sorry. So after 12 years with this woman that had this issue of blood, it's all over. And after 12 years of life, it's all over for his daughter. 12 years, both of them. Isn't that interesting? But that's not the end of the story. Do not trouble the teacher. Words that may have been spoken by Jairus just moments earlier, pushing through the crowd. Don't bother the teacher. And now the words 
have come back to haunt him. Don't bother the teacher. Your daughter is dead. But, it's one of the beautiful buts in the Bible. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. It reminds me of when Lazarus was risen from the dead. You remember he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who comes to me, though he die, yet he shall live. Do you believe this? Amen. So he tells him to believe. It's a bit of a jump, isn't it? When you've just gotten word that your daughter has died, that you've been delayed, you feel like a failure as a father, you did all that you could and it wasn't enough. Hey, you ever feel that way? Yes, sir. Well, then you probably know how Jairus felt at this point. And now Jesus turns to him in, in, in a moment of his deep grief and says, take it easy, man. If you just believe, it's going to be okay. Now, this would be incredibly empty if it didn't come from Jesus himself. If I told you, you told me that somebody died, I'd say, hey, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Cheer up. All you have to do is believe and they'll be back in no time. Let's go see. Let's open the coffin. It would be a cruel joke for me to do that. But for Jesus to do it, it's a completely different thing, isn't it? And so he tells him to believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. So he's got quite a chasm to leap. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. That's what he's asking him to do is to have faith in Jesus. You see, having faith in faith is stupid. Having faith like I just imagined something and I'm going to chant my way into having it is stupid. That's not faith at all. Faith is believing what Jesus said is true. That's what faith is. And it's not blind. It's believing what he said, not believing what I imagine. That's what real faith is. Faith has substance. It's evidence of things that are hoped for. In Hebrews 11:6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How many, of you, how many of you believe that God is? Let me see your hands. How many believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? How many of you are diligent? Much less, yes. That's what I thought. Isn't that peculiar? We believe it? Uh, kind of. Faith is believing it. And it's seen by evidence. Another thing about faith to this guy who lost his daughter and has to make this giant jump. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18, Paul writing to the Corinthians says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Isn't it interesting to look at something that's not seen? For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's the difference between looking at the outside of a person and looking into the heart of a person, the things that are unseen, the eternal realm, something other than the politics of the day or what's, what's happening with the police or any particular movement of the day or COVID-19. or We look at the things that are of eternal value, things that are real. God sees those things as real. These things are all temporary fading away, like watching a candle burn out. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, you can't have faith in something unless you've heard something that you need to put faith in. 
And when God's word comes and you know that it's true and you place your faith in it and you say, I believe what Jesus said is true, that the word of God is that which germinates inside of us and creates faith. So how much of the word of God are you putting in there? If you wonder why your faith is low in a time of affliction and you think it's the biggest thing in the whole world, it could be that you're not getting enough of the word of God inside of you. I know it happens when I don't. And yeah, it happens to me too. Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Yeah, St. Augustus, by the way. I pinched it from him. <laughs> faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. That's essentially the bottom line, I think, of what it says. Although, try to say it as soon as the screen goes away. It would be really tough. So when he came to the house, he permitted no one to go in except for Peter, James, and John, and the father of the mother of the girl. Father and the mother of the girl. So Jesus picks his three boys, Peter, James, and John. You notice he picks those three a lot? He never mixes it up. It's always those three. I don't know if they needed special supervision or if he was trying to teach them something. I do find it interesting that Peter writes a, a letter that we have called the Word of God. So does James, and so does John. All three of them have books, and you can read their work. All three of them died. So why these three guys? I, I sometimes wonder, and did the other disciples ever get jealous? Inquiring minds want to know. I just ask these questions all the time. The other disciples, you know, okay, what are you, what are you doing, Jesus? Oh, I'm going to go do this thing. It's going to be really cool. I'm going to pick three people. Okay, here it comes. James? Yep, that was John? Yep. And Peter? Oh, yeah, I knew it wasn't be me. You know, everybody else, you know. There are three specific times when he calls these three specific guys aside, and it's rather interesting. Number one is raising of Jairus' daughter, which we see here. The transfiguration. Remember, Jesus goes up on the mountain and he's transfigured before them. And the Garden of Gethsemane. You know what they all three have in common? They involve death. The raising of Jairus' daughter shows that Jesus is victorious over death, that death has no claim on him and he has power over death. Aren't you glad for that? When he was glorified in his death. Now you see when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah show up and they have a conversation. You remember the conversation's content? They were talking about what he was about to suffer and do. He's talking about his death. And so he's glorified on the other side, boys and girls. I mean, it's a done deal. Jesus has risen from the dead and he is at the right hand of the Father. <coughs> and we will go to see him. And the third thing is the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying, Father, if this cup could pass for me, if, you, if this job could be given to somebody else, or if we could just avoid this whole me dying on the cross thing. But he said, not my will, but thy will be done. All three of these, when he took these three guys aside, involved facing death head on. Death is one of those things that gives your life meaning. Hmm, sounds like a philosophy course. <laughs> you know what? Without death, life would have no meaning. Why would you live? Well, just so you could have another day. Well, why do you want another day? Well, just so I could live. Well, what do you want to live for? I don't know. There's lots of stuff I like, like eating. Okay. But then when you've eaten everything and, and you're used to it and you've done it for a million years, then what? I just want to live another day. You know, death is the object of life. It was for Jesus. And it is for us. Death is the ultimate accomplishment of your life. Your headstone. 
will contain all the important information that you leave behind. Just saying. Philippians 1, 20 to 21, Paul writing to the Philippians says, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So for me to live is to live for Christ. For me to die is even better because then we get to go home. And yet, if we don't live with eternity in view, life can get very bleak because you think this is all there is. If this is all you have, boy, you've got reason for depression and suicide because what does it mean? And yet, eternity with God in a new body, I'm on board. I'll take that. Now, all wept and mourned for her, but he said... Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. I find it interesting that a bunch of mourners can go from flat out crying and weeping and wailing to laughing. It means they laughed him to scorn. <laughs> what? What? Now, I don't know if you know about the Jews, but they're real quick to bury you. They get you in the ground or they get you in a sepulcher after washing your body and changing you and brushing your hair and making you look just awesome. They wrap you up and they put you in a tomb and they close the door, a big giant stone. Until a year later or so, they go back and gather all your stuff and pop you in a vase. It's called an ossuary, but anyway. So she's probably laid out, washed up, cleaned up, got her funeral garb on. She's gone. And Jesus comes with a smile on his face and he says, it's okay. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. That would seem ridiculous, right? And these folks, by the way, uh, Jairus was probably a very well-off man. He was, probably had some cash. He was probably one of, the, uh, one of the, the richer people in the neighborhood. He would have had professional mourners. I don't know if you knew that. Did you know that you can hire professional mourners? So these are professional mourners. These people come and they, they will... These are some ladies in Greece who are professional mourners. Yes, they still do it. These are folks in Africa. These are professional mourners. They get paid to come to your funeral and weep and wail loudly. This is a girl in Taiwan. They do things a little differently there because they give you a microphone. And this woman squelches and cries at the top of her lungs into a microphone at your funeral. So if you're doing a little early preparation for your funeral, they also have it in the UK where you get actors to come to your funeral and feel sorry for you that you're gone. And we also have them here in the United States. This is a commercial for Rent a Mourner. That's why these folks were able to go from weeping to laughing Jesus to scorn because they're paid employees. These are not heartfelt, you know, loving family members. These are paid employees who can turn it on, turn it off. It's acting 101. So Jesus takes them all and he says, get out. He puts them outside and he took her by the hand and called saying, little girl, arise. And her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. I like this passage. <laughs> you guys, out. You arise. And she does. And then he says, make sure you get her something to eat. 
that's cool. Jesus is cool. And I'm sure she's appreciative. But I'm sure she's wondering why it is that she's been cleaned and she's wearing a, a really nice dress. How'd that happen? I don't know if you've ever waken up in something else that you hadn't dressed yourself in. I'm being triggered again. <laughs> but I love the fact that he speaks to her and Mark tells us, this is what he says, Talitha kumi, which is little girl, arise. Talitha kumi. And it's interesting, Peter in chapter 9 in the book of Acts does the same thing to a woman named Tabitha who they called Dorcas, and I don't know why. Tabitha would have been fine. <laughs> and he says, Tabitha kumi. So maybe you're, but this is what he says, Talitha kumi, which is just such a beautiful thing. I can see Jesus saying it's Aramaic. Uh, everybody say, Talitha kumi. One more time, Talitha kumi. You don't know what'll happen when you say stuff like that. But when Jesus says it, people rise. And there's always food. <laughs> You'll see other instances of Jesus saying people that are risen from the dead, make sure you feed them. That's, that's a strange thing. Every post appearance of Jesus after he's resurrected, there's food. He appears, peace be with you. You got some fish? And he eats fish in front of them, they all go. And he's eating. He's on the road to Damascus. He gets pulled, pulled over to the side. They go in. They're breaking bread. There's food. Jesus goes back a week later. There's food everywhere Jesus goes, post-resurrection. And it's interesting. The first thing he says, make sure you feed her. <laughs> right away, Jesus. Getting your daughter back, a 12-year-old daughter, your only daughter who died, and you thought for sure she was gone forever, and Jesus gives her back to you. You bet I'm going to feed her. I'm going to feed her like she'd never been fed. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them not to tell, to tell no one what had happened. How come? Why don't you tell anybody what happened? Well, I imagine they would take this little girl and they'd make sure her hair was all back and then they would call Oprah. And then, because, you know, that's not dangerous at all, right? I mean, every time Oprah interviews somebody, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's a wonderful thing. And then the paparazzi are involved and then suddenly you're dead. What ended up happening was people would hear about Jesus and they started gathering around him for all the wrong reasons. It was like the circus was in town and none of them would listen to what he said. They're always looking for, for a free meal or some other thing. And it would make Jesus' job even harder. And the crowds would pack in even more. And you know, it's only one that he recognized in the crowd that he really wanted to have an interaction with. I find that amazing. So Jesus has this power over sickness and death, and we see how he takes charge. One of the nicest things about the story is none of these people had perfect faith. Here's a woman sneaking up behind Jesus with a hoodie on, hiding, and grabbing the tassel of his, like, what kind of superstition is that? Why not go up to Jesus and ask him face to face? Because she had a little faith. And yet the scripture says all we have to have is a little faith. I think about Jairus, who went and got Jesus and thought, you know, we're going to make this thing happen. I'm going to push, plow through the crowd. Okay, guys. Don't bother the teacher. He's on a job. He's working with me now. Come on, out of the way. And finding out his daughter's gone. And now he's got to step out and go home and see her and bring Jesus. And he thinks that's it. It's over. I was late. I failed. Jesus didn't come in time and it was my fault. Each of them had a little bit of faith. It wasn't a big faith. It was a little faith. And Jesus honored that. And Jesus will honor your little faith and my little faith. And he can do incredible things in our lives. 
going to ask the worship team to come up.